Ed Corin has been a cartoonist for The New Yorker for decades, creating his funny, memorable, wiggly, fuzzy characters. He has also contributed to and illustrated many other books and publications written and illustrated several books for children. Ed received a gold medal this year for excellence in book editorial and design from the National Independent Book Publishers, Publishers Association. Howard Norman, and by the way, I believe Howard Norman may be presenting here next summer. Howard Norman, the nationally esteemed author and longtime friend of Ed Corrin said, Ed magically induces people within his proximity to utter outlandish things. He causes this to happen. And he cites this incident of one winter afternoon, I met Ed in the cafeteria of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the very moment he sat at our table after sizing up the romantic couple at the next table. The young woman reached across that table to place her hand over the hand of her companion and said, Thomas, tell me everything you know about food. Hearing this, Ed merely shrugged, took out his notebook, made a quick sketch, and jotted down, tell me everything you know about food. It's, ni it's nice to witness the birth of a caption. In this collection that Ed's going to talk about today, in this collection of cartoons, Ed Coram illustrates country life, X, 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 urbanites, locals, and the ironies of living in the boondocks. His cartoons have Vermonters looking at city folk and the city folk looking at Vermonters, described by him as a mash of interactions and small pieces of theater. Corrin's humor, his signature fuzzy and human aid creatures delight readers and country dwellers or not. In addition, Corrin has deep roots here in Vermont and has been an active member of the Brookfield Volunteer Fire Department for 30 years, and he still is. So of course, here is someone who needs no introduction, Ed Corrin. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, tell me if I uh, fade away, if you can't hear me. Um, in fact, I will take this, take this out and wander around. Um, two things. Um, one, Vermont, well, three things, put this down. Um, two things. One, Vermont is only one of the subjects I prey on. So it's, <laughs> so it's not, uh, I'm not exclusively a um, chronicler of Vermont Versus urban versus rural sensibilities. There, there are lots, lots in between and lots beyond. Uh, and second, Howard's, uh, when he described that moment in the Metropolitan Museum, uh, erroneously thought that was going to be a cartoon. But in turn, in, in, uh, as it turns out, it didn't quite work. And um, so what, what I'm trying, going to do this afternoon, um, is show you some tidbits, some chocolates on the screen. Those of you here might uh, find it hard to see them. I will read the captions since even those here can't read them at all. Uh, they were quite small. Um, this is, these are selected from the book that was just published. Um, and it's, you've seen, some of you have seen this before, but in a sense, um, part these, these drawings. Uh, are rich enough to be to see again and to savor and to look and to uh, go into the kind of detail I am very fond of using in telling the stories that each of these represent. Um, another thing is that I, in listening, I don't know whether many of you were here for David McCauley's talk, but it kind of it interests me that both he and I, well, he, I follow him. We're both people for whom the verbal and the visual components of what we do are intertwined. There, there's no separation, and uh, one depends on the other. Um, even with drawings I do without captions, the verbal con context, the, the uh, 
the, the intellectual context are all verbal in some way and can be verbalized. Um, one of the things I'd like you to think about, and one of the things I'm thinking about, is why cartoons? Why do I do them? What possible use do they have uh, other than to me uh, to satisfy my desire to take revenge <coughs> or, or to observe oddities or to, to uh, paraphrase Lily Tomlin, no matter how cynical I get, I can never keep up. <laughs> so that, and this is the fabric of my life. It's the soul of it. I mean, I'm really interested in human behavior and um, how it plays out and what it looks like and who is doing it and what those, in drawing people um, who are doing it, how I can endow them with character and a kind of motivation and a, and a soulfulness that, that really can escape one in just verbal storytelling. Uh, so this is, a, an, an, if you will, an add-on add form of telling stories, um, as, as opposed to simply fiction or nonfiction. Um, I was reading uh, a few days ago a, a piece in The New Yorker. Uh, I do read it, as well as contribute to it. I encourage you all not only to read it, but subscribe to it and keep this treasure alive in, in a culture that is working hard to kill it off. Um, a, a piece about aphorisms, and it dawned on me that what I do is a kind of, not only telling stories, but it's an aphorism. Uh, I'm an aphorist, in a way, in, the, in a short, uh, pungent, quick way. Um, and the writer of this piece was characterized aphorisms in a way that, that is Adam, Adam Gopnik, um, characterized aphorisms in a way that I thought was very, very poignant to what I'm going to show you. And, and, and I encourage you to think about this when you look at them. Um, he says, we test... Uh, aphorism. We test them against our experience. The empirical test of the aphorism takes the form first of laughter and then of longevity and its confidential tone makes it candid, not cynical. So I encourage you to think of these as not cruel, not cynical, but observations. Uh, and satire can go either way. It can become quite cruel as in say, the uh, work of Gilray and uh, Hogarth uh, and other masters of our trade, or less so and more gentle, as in, say, Thurber, uh, all of whom have influenced me. So um, what I will just start with this PowerPoint. What I will, we're very short in time here. It's, um, we've got 40 minutes. Um, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Tell me if you cannot hear me, because I tend to... You can't hear. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Um, we're, we're short. 40 minutes is not quite enough. And um, I encourage you to ask questions because the Q&A at the end is not often enough. And uh, we'll probably not get through this whole PowerPoint because it's quite long. But the, answer, the questions uh, are of, of interest as well. So I'm happy to answer them as we go. And if anything prompts one, please pipe up. So uh, I'll start off with, with, I'll just start off. And these are, as when I said chocolates, I mean these are what Robert Benchley characterized cartoons as, as chocolates and or, and, or salted almonds, take your pick, uh, wherein you have one and you continue on as fast as you can with the next. So, um, so this is just a characterization of um, my life as a cartoonist. Um, slightly autobiographical, but, but it's oftentimes the odd, uh, oddity where people who are, who are most the object of my interest love it all, and it's, even though it could be a little detrimental. Um, men <laughs> drinking coffee. Uh, I'm going to read it because you may not see it. Uh, and this, was a, this is a drawing that I did many years ago. Uh, I've been doing this close to 60 years. 
uh, publishing in the venerable Comic Weekly. Um, and this was probably in the 19, early 70s. And it hasn't, nothing's changed since. <laughs> Um, that too is old. Going out of business, a pet shop. <clears throat> when you consider what a pet owner does when he decide, makes that decision, this is what happens. Maybe. Uh, sorry. Um, this is more recent. Um, it's a farm stand and what the woman is saying, actually the captions are cut off, but it, she's saying our eggs today are awesome. <clears throat> um, that, which I actually heard somebody say, unlike what Howard reported. Um, and this, I will show you next what, how the, um, the, car, the pro, people are interested in the process. I and mean, cartoons promote incredible amount of interest um, and curiosity because they're such a hybrid and strange art form. Um, and, and the process of, of thinking about them, drawing them, submitting them, um, and finally having them published is, is complex and, uh, and, and the source of incredible uh, curiosity. And for me too. Um, this is how that drawing started. Um, the idea came from someone who said, just that <laughs> at a farm stand. Uh, some farmers we know uh, called the Green Mountain Girls and uh, I walked into their, their store and they said just that. So I couldn't resist. So I submit, this is the drawing I submitted to the New Yorker. It's a very, very rough um, pencil drawing and there's no point in developing an idea if it's going to be rejected and the chances of rejection are very, very high. So um, I have never calculated the percentage, but it's huge. Um, so this is how, it, how it's submitted and, and how it's conceived. I mean, you see the process. David McCauley talked about process, which is always to us artists a fascinating um, topic. And just how do you go about your work? Where do you get your ideas? What, which is more important, the, the, the idea or the, the uh, re resolution of it or the realization of it? So this was the first step. And the last, this is how it ended up. Um, and why is it so complex? Uh, and why is it in black and white oh, in the way it is? Uh, the black and white is because it reproduces far better than in pencil, it would, you, you'd hardly see it. Um, and the development of the idea was such that the eggs were sparse a little bit in the original thought and the thinking, thinking it out. And as I thought about how to make it more, even funnier, and how to tell this back to the storytelling, how to make it really, really uh, funnier to me, and hopefully the others, I just enlarged everything. The size of the chickens, the number of eggs, their prominence, and the, and the scale of the people in front, and how it, technically, how it just uh, uh, is resolved by re receding into the, to the distance. And, to, and then finally these mountain ranges of chickens uh, in the back. So that, that's, that's a, a kind of <clears throat> uh, illumination, although um, I'm very fond of talking. When I talk, <clears throat> I'd like to, uh, there's a caveat that, that has to do, um, that, that I love to, 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 to talk about, which is that of, or quote, E.B. White. Um, because you can't possibly uh, illuminate every, all the ways in which these cartoons and any other work of art come to light. He says, I write by ear, always with difficulty, and seldom with any notion of what is taking place under the hood. So, uh, um, there. So, this is, if those of you who can't see it, there are two signs in the cemetery, smoking and non-smoking. Uh, 
it was done a while ago, you know, when, when that was even more uh, suspect, under question, but now we know that <coughs> there's no, there's no, no issue here. Um, I went to a cemetery in Montpelier just to have the veracity of a cemetery. And um, all those monuments do in fact exist in the cemetery in Montpelier. Um, and almost the entryway is a little bit like that. But um, detail is important to me uh, because it's, it gives it a kind of uh, quirky twist to the, to these, this weird situation that I conjure up. Um, has a, a basis in, in, in real, real reality, in, in, in things. And, and also, like David Macaulay, I love things. I love to be, uh, I love sh the, the, how the shapes and the forms just uh, have a certain life of their own, and I give them a little bit different life, but it, it, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to me. Any impressionists in this crowd? <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I don't know how, where that came from, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dialogue between the, the, the artist and those who tell me always that they love the arts and uh, they're clearly on them, who knows what they're doing, but they love the arts. I think this may be an appropriate moment to say a few words in memory of the animals we've slaughtered for our pleasure. <laughs> this, needless to say, this appeared uh, at an issue close to Thanksgiving. <laughs> but the, again, the, the, the accumulation of detail and, and, and a number of these these remnants of animals of all sorts, of the sea, of the, of the land, and perhaps even of the air, but um, you know, we all know a guy like that, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm a little bit that way too, so it's, uh, it, well, much of this is autobiographical, I have to say, and, uh, and uh, in, in defense of some of this. Artisanal pottery, and there on the bottom is a sign that says artisan, but the artisan clearly is, um, you know, you have to interpret his expression. And um, he's produced all of this work, it's surrounding him, it's unsold, that's one scenario. There are others that might crop up to you, but most of this is, uh, of what I'm showing you, is, is open to interpretation of your own. And uh, hence my question earlier about what cartoons mean to you and why they're funny <coughs> to you, personally, individually and not to others who will keep a straight stone face when they watch these things. Your mother and I think it's time you got a place of your own. We'd like a little time alone before we die. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Judging by the laughter, I think this has some resonance. <laughs> but um, we all know the situations like this. You will note that the, his, you probably can't see it so easily, but his sweatshirt uh, of that balding son is, uh, it says University of Vermont. <laughs> and it's slightly tattered, so uh, you can make of that what you want. Divorce sale. Uh, um, it, this, this, this requires close looking. Uh, as do most cartoons, because it's, you know, the cartoons are, are, are like, again, like chocolates. They're, they're consumed in a few seconds. But if you take the time with some of them, not all of them, uh, and delve into them as if you were looking at a Bruegel or a Bosch <laughs> or someone of detail, uh, you will find all kinds of the, how the artist has, has worked out the uh, scenario of the, the situation. And this, as you will see, there's an aisle between these two irreconcil this irreconcilable couple. And on her side is all the household tasks that she got herself involved in in this marriage. And he, on the other side, 
it was the handyman and the groundskeeper and the fixer and so on. I mean, it's, it's, it's ex exceptionally retrograde in many ways, and the, which is my point. Um, and he has a shotgun, he has tools, he has his boat, and God knows what else. And she, you know, there are all the chairs and the, the, the refrigerator with the magnets on it. And it, it, it's worth looking at. I'd like my daughter to know something about engines. <laughs> and again, detail and story. Um, that garage is the garage of a man uh, who I revered, Leon, of, uh, <clears throat> who repaired Saab, Saab Mecca in Montpelier. And uh, that's my old Saab. That's me and my daughter, sort of. And, uh, you know, it, it was at a time when, earlier on, when, when that idea of STEM for women, so to speak, was uh, hardly in existence. So um, it still has some resonance today. There, God's <laughs> wrath level high. <laughs> it, it dawns on me that I should have concluded this talk with that as my political statement. <laughs> but um, so it, 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 this is a, a combination of my observations of. of um, billboards or announcement boards outside churches and those outside forest wardens. Uh, yes? So is that guaranteed to get a congregation in the door or keep them away? Uh, <laughs> a good question. Does that guarantee a congregation getting indoors or out? Uh, depends on the level of fire and brimstone. Put it that way. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Good for you, bad for you. Supermarket aisle. Uh, earlier on, before so much has, has, has uh, I mean, this was probably in the 1980s, um, when, when just the, the revving up of the interest in organic foods and wellness, that awful word, wellness, um, and you, what you might not be able to see is the guilty pleasure of a couple who look as if they should know better in the bad for you aisle. But um, I do not wish to interpret this for you because there's, there really is a lot there to take in. Um, another church, he says, great for worship then, good for retail now. And it's a church with a for sale sign on it, which we are seeing more and more of in Vermont. Um, most recently, I saw one in Chelsea West Hill, a beautiful church, just like that, that is for sale. Just, just out of business last year. Um, another something we all partake of, Nordic skiing. Uh, and the guy is saying to the, to the other, the man on the left, to the, the skier on the right who is on his cell phone, is saying, hey, this is the quiet trail. Now this actually happened in front of me, and I mean I didn't say it, but the guy, it was a, at the a, a ski Nordic area in, um, up in Stowe, and some man just like that zoomed by me, you know, barking into his cell phone. I mean, like, and I wished wanted in my uh, reformer's way to go after him and say just that, but I didn't. I didn't. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, it was more effective, I hope. Um, so, how far is two pounds from here? <laughs> so, this, this also comes a little bit from experience. I live in a place that is close to an inn where in years past there were hiking tours. Vermont country walkers, and they would look just like that. <clears throat> um, but they never asked me that question. Um, and they would, you know, uh, when in great uh, ambition, start hiking up the hill near my house. And I always thought, you know, what was in their mind. So, um, experience is not always the uh, 
progenitor of what I do. A lot of it is what I imagine. So uh, that I've seen, but to put it all together is kind of uh, a, a, a great joy. He says, I'm, be he says, I'm beginning my annual reunion with Polar Tech, Flintslate, Fleece, and my oldest friend, Wool. Uh, I often set, there's, a, there's an interesting question of where I set these things I overhear or I think about. And in this case, I uh, decided to situate it in New York or a city with uh, doorways with awnings over them that you would not see in Vermont. Look what we found yesterday when we were cleaning out the attic. <laughs> The question is, sometimes people ask me, well, where do you, why do you situate these, these drawings where you do? And this is the kind of, reminds me a little of the porch of one of my dearest friends of a house in Maine. It's a porch I, I love and will hold dear for my entire life. And it keeps cropping up in, in my cartoons only because I, I have enormous fondness for it and uh, great memories and thoughts about it. So that's the porch, and that's the kind of furniture on the, on, on the porch. Yes? And the collection of flowers, it looks like there's a lot of attention paid. I, I'm sorry, the question? There's a, there's a flower pot in the lower left corner that goes, it seemed like there was a lot of attention paid. It was beautiful. Yeah, the, the, the flower, I mean, these, these are exactly the details I, I'm, I'm interested in. Um, the flower pot, exactly so. And, but, you know, this is also where it's, where it's placed. I mean, it's another issue, another interest. Is how do you construct these? Uh, they may be. I'm not very good with flowers, but I... Um, but constructing the, uh, a cartoon is very much like constructing any visual... Uh, any artist will construct or think about the, uh, the composition of their work. And in my case, it's... it's how to orchestrate where your attention goes uh, in all this complexity, and who's talking and who's listening, and what the expressions actually convey, if they convey anything concrete. Oftentimes it's ambivalent uh, and ambiguous, as it should be. You know, it's what I strive for. Um, but it's, it's, it's channeling your eye to that little fuzzy kind of remnant of some war that was in the attic. Uh, and, and so the flower pot being in the foreground on the left side pushes your eye that way and it also orchestrates the space. So that helps that as well. So you, you're right to see it. And, and well, there's another porch. A uh, similar porch, same porch almost, same chairs, no flower pot, um, but again, it's the same issues, but it solved in a different way. Um, there was, there's an architect who, uh, one of the problems of living so long and working so, so long as well, is that there's always a danger of repeating yourself in, in terms of, well, uh, the scenes in with which one uh, works for your characters, and also just ideas. But um, as uh, an architect who I think is Vignoli once said, said, of course I repeat myself, but I repeat myself differently. So <laughs> this is different. It's a differently structured, differently ah, constructed. The black of that woman's skirt is next to the, the guest. Uh, the guest, the neighbor, is, is calculated to draw your eye right there. And the antlers are proportioned for that reason too. Sometimes unconsciously. I mean, I'm, I'm oftentimes struck after the fact that I did this. But it's, it's, it's instinctive and uh, long, long uh, years of solving these problems. I'm, David McCauley talked about solving problems as being the most interesting uh, and working out the actual drawing, uh, both 
uh, was a little less interesting to him. But I take issue with it because I love the hands-on, tactile, haptic way of working. That for me, it's a great, again, a great joy. Yeah. What drew you to drawing people as in a humanoid quality or looking as they do? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not quite following. Drawing in a humanoid quality? They tend to have be furrier and furry <laughs> and have, in the write-up it says if you use humanoid. Well, it's an interesting word. Um, <laughs> I think we're all humanoid in some ways. That we, the, there's no boundary between us and that creature. Why big noses? Well, as Gilbert Stewart said, the nose is the key to character. So there. Uh, so why I can't answer that. I mean, it's just has happened over time for years, and I take pleasure in drawing it that way. Um, I don't know what's going on under the hood, really. <laughs> Five minutes, okay. Questions, more, any more questions? Oh, lots of questions, sir. What is the difference between comedy and truth? What is the difference between comedy and truth? Well, that's the, the nub of this whole question of what I do and what stand-up comedians do and what you know, television comedians do. I, I think in a way, the aphorism, is, the description of the aphorism is exactly that. It's, it's just uh, a generalization about human behavior. And that's the truth. I and mean, it can go anywhere. Uh, so beyond that, I, we'll have a course in philosophy in the next hour. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So um, how do you deal with, like, you know when you threshold lines of black and white? You know when you like threshold lines to black and white and they get a bit thinner or looser? How yeah. have you dealt with like how have you dealt with you use a lot of very thin lines? How have you dealt with like having to deal with losing them in reproduction or anything like that? Uh, that's always an interesting question, especially since reproduction has become digital. Um, and uh, it, I I accommodate it. I get to instinctively know how to push one or the other because it's now is it very different than when the New Yorker was publishing earlier on when they used uh, actual engraving plates. Uh, so it, it, where the quality of reproduction is much, much better. Uh, but it's also a technical question that, that, that I love to answer. And, and thank you for bringing that up because I, I mull about this a lot. Uh, yes? If, if I'm right, is your process any different since was it Lee Lorenz who used to be the New Yorker mm. cartoon editor and now is it Roz Chas? No, the, no. Lee Lorenz, how is my process different from the is, is there, your experience working with one? Experience you know? working with editor, cartoon editor. Yes. I've worked with now four. Um, at, the at the New Yorker. When I first started out, I was encouraged by a man named James Garrity, Jim Garrity. Uh, I was brought into the, into the fold slowly, very slowly by him, uh, tentatively. I then worked with Lee Lorenz, who was his, his successor. Um, and then after that, a man named Bob Mankoff. And now the fourth is a woman, named, a young woman named Emma, Emma, Emma Allen. And uh, how do I work with them? Yeah, it Differently. It just feels different, it's all. Yeah, and uh, has it changed the way I, I conceive of things or work? No, not at all. And I've been, you know, gone, gone with the winds that blew with, with each cartoon in it. And, but I prevail somehow. Yes. The next cartoon? Oh, one, one here, please. I wonder how you interact with the firemen. How do I interact with the firemen who are my chums? Uh, in a way, we joke, we joke around. Do I keep them? They don't really know what I do. They, many of them don't see, read The New Yorker. Uh, they kind of know what I do. I've done a number of uh, uh, pro bono things for our fundraisers, for t-shirts and so on. That they know. Uh, one of them even asked me to do a drawing for the 
this plastic cup that he gave out at his wedding. I thought that I was really touched by that. You know, we, we get along on a very different level, and uh, that's just the way it should be. Yeah. Show so. the next cartoon. I'm sorry. Show the next cartoon. I see. Them. Show the next cartoon. Well, uh, okay. If um, this is a good one to end up. Rufus, stop being naughty with Mrs. Curtis. <laughs> And, you know, this has gotten a kind of uh, rebirth through the latest uh, revelations of Jeffrey Weinstein. <laughs> you know, and Weinstein and, and Jeffrey, whatever is it, uh, Siegel. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, any, any more questions? Um, yeah. How big is the original of that drawing? Um, it's not much smaller than that. <clears throat> it's... Um, Let's say about 20 by 30 inches. I draw very big. Why? Because I love to draw. I love, the, again, as I said, the feeling, the touch, the gesture, the, the paper. Uh, it, it's very, you know, I don't use uh, what young cartoonists are now using, which is basically digital. All the, everything they do is digital. It's on a pad and it's all small and, uh, and to my mind, a little less complex than, than it could be. And, yeah. What was your breakthrough cartoon for the New Yorker, the one that was published first? My breakthrough cartoon in the New Yorker that was published first. Um, it was a drawing that I will renounce, <laughs> in a sense. It was not very good. <clears throat> and, uh, and it was kind of lame as an idea, but it, it, it was a period of time in 1962 when sweatshirts and t-shirts, but particularly sweatshirts, started to sprout sayings and words and sensibilities of the wearer. And there was a, the scene was a, 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 an extremely frustrated writer at his typewriter and with piles of paper around and a sense of dismay and hopelessness and the, sh the, the sweatshirt said Shakespeare <laughs> you know well now it seems as I described it not oh not not uh, immense so at any rate are we how are you doing that's it okay thank you all right, all right. Thanks.